Welcome back to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. This is our weekly hour devoted to exploring ideas and subjects of special importance to people of African descent and to everyone working to build a better society. I'm your host, Greg Carr, and we think every week we're providing something that is unique and joining in the work of the Black Star Network to do that work. But today we have something that is singularly unique. We are joined by the founder and the chief executive officer of the Black Star Network in order to discuss his latest book, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their mind. And that would be none other than Roland S. Martin. This is the brother who we all know well, award-winning host, managing editor of Roland Martin Unfiltered, the founder of the Black Star Network, the OTC Network, uh, a daily commentator in a range of media, including iHeartMedia, is heard all over the country and, in fact, all over the world. Uh, a commentator in uh, white media, whether it be ABC, MSNBC, BBC. Uh, we met in the wake of uh, his public service. He's always everywhere, all the time. And we could talk about a lot of things. I'm just going to mention one other thing because I know he's ran to talk about this book. Uh, he's a member of the Texas A&M University Journalist Ring of Honor an inductee to the National Association of Black Journalists Hall of Fame. And in 2022, the felt he was nominated and became a fellow of the Society of Professional Journalists. I should also mention that he is a professor, uh, has been a scholar in residence at Fisk University, soon to be joined by Talladega University, has spoken at a number of HBCUs, including many commencements. And of course, he is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, the oldest and the coldest. Welcome to your network, and to <laughs> <laughs> brother Roland Martin. How are you, brother? I'm all good, all good. Glad to be here. Let's get it. We are happy, no question. And I know, I know that was a long, long introduction. But I tell you what, man, this book, White Fear, in a very succinct way, you have captured so much of what is going on today, and you put it all in historical context. I believe, as you always said, it was my Angelou that said that you are a natural teacher. Yeah. And this book is a teaching text, brother. So uh, if you don't mind, maybe we can start with this because you're constantly processing, constantly, and we'll talk a little bit later about how you deconstruct major issues for folk uh, on, on a daily basis. What was your process in, in writing this book? Well, it was, um, it was interesting because um, Jan Miller, Jan Miller's literary agent. I met her at uh, an Emma Smith golf tournament. We actually, they actually sat me next to her and we were just talking. And, and Jan has represented Joel Osteen, Bishop T.D. Jakes, uh, Dr. Phil, Cicely Tyson. I mean, she's like represented some major, major people. And so we're just sitting at the table and we're talking. And, uh, and she asked me, you know, uh, like two or three ideas. And she's like, oh my God, I love all of those. She says, She's, I want to represent you. And I was like, you know, I, I'd already published five books myself. Um, so I didn't necessarily feel, feel as if I needed a literary agent. I didn't care about the publishing world. I didn't care about their validation. I didn't need them to say yes or no to we're going to publish this because I could do it my damn self. And I was like, you know, all right, cool. And so for like three years, Jan kept going, Roland, when are you going to get me something? And uh, and I told her it, 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 I was so busy. I was just so just too many things that were going on. And and I'm like, I, I need somebody who can just do this for me. And I just I, I can't. There's some people who can sit down and over three or six months, just block out this time and just focus on this. But I have way too many other things that are going on. No question. And I, and I was at the NAACP convention in 2018 in San Antonio. And I met a sister who's a publicist who said, I got it. There's a woman I know who was a ghostwriter. I was like, are you serious? She's like, yeah. She's like, I'll connect y'all. I immediately hit her up, Leah Lakins. And I said, Jan, all right, we ready. And, and it was just, and, and, the, and the thesis of the book I've been talking about, I've been writing it in columns. I've been talking about it on television. I've been talking about it on radio. But the book process was different. And so and so I called Leah. I said, Leah, listen, I do not have time to literally sit down and write this. Hmm. So what I'm going to do is I will do a complete brain dump. And so we probably had 10, 15 conversations where I would just talk. And so I actually and, and I give and people what people don't understand is 
uh, I speak all around the country, all around the world. I don't write speeches. I've only written two speeches in my life. I never read from them. I was like, well, that was a waste of my damn time. Yeah, can I ask you, just because that would that is a revelation, I'm sure, to many people who are watching right now. Um, I think about the great jazz musicians and how they didn't <laughs> compose every note. They would lay out right. the charts and then every night they say, Sonny Rollins, you go see him five nights in a row. It's going to be five different concerts. Yes. Here you speak. It is well organized. It's laid out. You have the theses, the punctuation points. But you're saying that is where does that come from? Then if you're not writing it down, Ro? there's no like. OK, when I say when I say I don't write it down, there is no outline. Mm hmm. Oh, you don't there even have no, a chart in your mind. You no, have. no, no, no. There are no notes. There's, there are no, there's, there's the, like literally none of that. If this was rap, it's, it's, it's completely freestyle. There literally is no, uh, there, there's none of that. And so, um, what well, I do. I suspect that Leah Lakins did a substantial amount of work, but this book is in your voice and it is organized yes. in the logic that you speak. So I don't know how much work that, she really had to that, do. Right. That, that's, that's how it was done. So literally, literally, that's why it was funny when I, when I had to do the, when I had to do the audible version, I, people, people said, Oh my God, I love listening to the audible version because I'm hearing you. And I was like, yeah, because <laughs> I, I read it like I speak, yes. which is how, how she put it together. And, and so for me, it was literally, here's the thought, and I would just unfold it. And then she would ask a question and I would unroll it. And then she would ask a question and then and I would just talk And sometimes I would just talk for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and, and again, what people don't understand, you know, I've done our 90 minute lectures and it's, it's no notes. It's no, it's no reference points. It's none of that. You're, you will rarely ever see me like pull my phone out and, if I if I read something and, and I'm quoting it, it's because I literally just saw it. Uh, like when I spoke Saturday, when I spoke uh, to the NAACP in Spokane, Washington, I was reading the book that you gave me uh, on um, on um, um, on W. B. Du Bois, uh, yeah. his speeches, and and I and I I began my speech with his quote in his, in the Hampton Idea speech. Actually, before that, talking about speaking truth. Yes. Um, and yeah. so, and so when I, so doing the book is the same way I speak. What I do is I literally walk into the room and I feel the room. I, I allow it, it, it is all spiritual. I, I discern. And so I walk into the room and, and I feel I, I can, I, I can literally feel the room. I can literally feel what the tension, the drama is and what this audience needs to hear. Mm -hmm. And so when I speak, I mean, there have been moments where I settled on what I was going to say. And, and let me say when I settled on what I was going to say, I don't I don't settle on three points. I literally come up. This is probably because of my, my newspaper background. I come up with the headline. And then I speak. So the, the title of my speak, my speech drives what I do. And that's what happens. Let me ask you about that as well. And by the way, uh, and that's why this book the same way. So like, that, like, like, like the title was like point blank, white fear, white fear, no question. And then, and then the subtitle. So that was, so I have been talking about this for 13 years. And when I lay out, when I say that, that when I would, me and John Avalon were at CNN in 2009, that's when this book title, I said, John, we're, this is what I said, John, we are living in the beginning stages of white minority resistance. Yes, I see it. And it's white fear. And so that's what drove it. So that's why it was no stretch to figure out what to call this. It was like, boom, here it is. And then when January 6th happened, because like every time it was crazy, they kept they kept pushing it back. And I kept saying, listen, y'all, white people are going to keep losing their minds. So <laughs> at some point, we're going to have to publish this book because you can't just keep waiting. It was like Charlottesville. And it was like the next thing, the next thing. And then when January 6th happened out and, and they kept pushing the deadline back. I said, you can't push it back further because I actually wanted the book to be out uh, before the election. Actually, I actually wanted to be out at the beginning of uh, 2020. And it was like something else happened. So we went back and had to change some stuff. And then when January 6th happened, I, I, I never forget, I was in Atlanta. It was a day after Warnock uh, and Ossoff won the runoff. I was in a restaurant 
I was with the Warnock campaign celebrating the win and I was watching it unfold on television and I was standing there and I was smiling. And somebody was like, man, why are you smiling? I said, oh, I'm smiling. I said, because now the rest of the world now gets to understand what black people have been talking about. I said, this is white fear. And so that's why that image is from January 6th. Yes. And the image you see right, right here is a white man with his arms outstretched like he's Jesus. And what he's saying is, hey, he's saying, all of this is ours. Is ours, no question. No. So question. all of that. So so, and again, because I'm an old newspaper guy. So for me, the image and the headline and the subhead, they all have to flow together. So when you see it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And maybe we can pick this up after the first break. But I do want to ask you now. Maybe you can get a minute, a minute or two on this. Um, you pioneered the use of the word lie in broadcast media. I remember when you were at TV one, you saying, yeah, they won't call him a lie, won't call him that. Now you pick up the New York Times, the Washington Post, the word lie around Donald Finally. Trump. So my my question really is, as white fear has has this book emerged, what changed, Roland? What changed? Oh, and, and what, what changed was- the one saying it. <laughs> they, they, could, they could not, they could, look, the, the default, the default of mainstream white media is to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, it's to speak in these non-human, non, what we, well, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to, you know, shade it. We don't want to take sides. We don't, no, 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 no. Truth is truth. I mean, again, I, let, let, again, let me just, it, it, again, it, it just resonated and it's, this is real simple. This is literally what Dubois said. For in the world, this alone is necessary that if a man speak and act, he speak and act the truth and not a lie. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. that's from the Hampton Ideas speech, 1906. Yes, sir. That's, that's, that's succinct. And so yes. the problem is mainstream white media does not want to apply real life. If I came home at 2 a.m., my daddy, son, where you been? Right. Now I can sit here. My my daddy is not going to say, uh, "Son, you are you're, you're stretching the truth." Mm. Um, he, he's not going to say, um, "That's a misconception that you are providing to me." He's going to say, "He's right. going to say, why your ass lying? Why are you lying?" <laughs> so hey. mainstream mainstream media is like, "Well, no, no, no." In order for us to call it a lie. Yes. We have to know the intent of the person saying it. We have to know their intent. No, if I came home at 2 a.m., my intent is to lie so I don't get my ass whooped. Yes. So I know. So daddy know the intent because I'm trying to come up with something to explain why I rolled in at 2 a.m. when I was supposed to be home by midnight. So you call it uh, you call a thing a thing. You oh, call a lie a lie. Yes, sir. Well, we're going to pick up with that right after the break. Um, we are here with the founder and the CEO of the Black Star Network, Roland Martin, uh, who just uh, quoted his father, Reginald Martin Sr., who I know is watching this as we speak. We will come back on the other side of the break uh, here at the Black Table back in a moment. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear.
Welcome back to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. We're joined by the founder and CEO of the Black Star Network, Roland Martin, author of White Fear. And uh, when we left, Roland, you were quoting your father saying, you don't call a lie a lie, and you were quoting our frat brother, W.E.B. Du Bois. And you know, it, it occurred to me as you were talking, and I hadn't made this connection, that like Du Bois, uh, in the education of black people, speeches before historically black colleges, white fear is really driven by a voice that you have been honing and crafting now for decades. And in that Hampton idea uh, speech that he gave in 1906, he talks about the great fear. So here we are a century and almost two decades later, and you're talking about the great fear. What is white fear? Ro? It's real simple. And that is, this has been theirs from the beginning from the start hmm. that 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 scene i love it every time i play it i get in trouble because youtube they block it <laughs> um but but that that great scene from the good shepherd yes. um it, it it's it, it's real clear i mean they 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 say it this scene between joe pecci uh and matt damon and matt damon is a wasp uh and um and joe pecci is a mobster and they're going to him uh, for the purpose of trying to kill uh, Castro. Uh, the movie was directed by uh, Robert De Niro, uh, also st stars Angelina Jolie. And Joe Pecci's character, he said, let me ask you something. He said, we Italians got our family. The Irish got this. He said, the Catholics got this. He said, now we got the mean. He said, even the N-words, they've got their music. Hmm. What do you people have? And without even looking up, Matt Damon says, we have the United States of America. The rest of you are just visiting. <laughs> that so white fear is this is ours. We ain't giving this up. So now all of a sudden we are becoming the America, the melting pot. Uh, we are becoming that nation. See. And so, and so the fear is, wait a minute, hold up, wait a minute, hold up. Y'all are now trying to redefine what it means to be an American? Yes, because to be an American has been white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Yes. Now all of a sudden, they now have to now factor in because now we are elected to office, we now are CEOs, we now are owners, we now have opinions, we now are, no, we, we now are not fully subjugated uh, to their control. So we now are in advertising. We're now in media. We now are writing columns. We now are show hosts. So they no longer get to control the narrative. Mm -hmm. And so the fear is that of redefining what it means to be American. The fear is, hold up, we, we, we got to share power. We got to share money. We got to share. Whoa, whoa, whoa. King talks about that. And where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Yes. Where he, where he, where he literally says white America is not prepared for it. They, they simply are wholly unprepared and wholly uneducated in dealing with this. And so I lay out in every point in history when we've had black success, it's followed by white backlash because the fear is they're taking our jobs. They're taking our resources. They're taking what is ours. They're taking our land. They're taking our women. They're mm -hmm. taking our culture. And that's and, and that's so that's the natural every single time something happens. And so it's in the data. It's in the polling data. It's in the research. And so this thing started when I said this poll that was taken, the question was asked, are you optimistic about the future of America for your children? Every group said a majority said yes, except white Americans. September 2016, the question was asked, are you optimistic? about the future of America economically for the next 10 years. Black people, lowest wealth, highest optimism. That's an oxymoron. Latinos, right. second lowest wealth, second highest optimism. White people, by far, largest wealth, lowest optimism. And so you, you then have to now go to the, the, the second, the third, the fourth, and fifth layer to go, hold oh, up, why is that? Because at every step of the way, they have been conditioned that if we now are getting something black, Latino, Asian, Native American. That means they are losing what they haven't had to confront, which is now the issue. Yes. It's now population decline. The white death rate That's is what higher in about 15 states than white birth rate. So y'all want, we losing. No, y'all dying. That's right. 
well, well, you're not well, repopulating. Well, that's what I want to ask you about, Roland. It's very interesting. I mean, four sections, elegantly framed, very direct, four sections, three chapters, section one, three chapters, section two, two chapters each, sections three and four, data-driven, history-driven, metaphor-driven, and uh, as we know, we've heard you talk about that metaphor from uh, the, the Good Shepherd, and, and that's in chapter six, I believe, one of your favorite metaphors in section two. But the way you frame it and you talk about data, you, you open the book talking about this two, 2018 Pew uh, data, and you frame this whole context, uh, you, you use a number, 2043. That's it. And the, what what is what help us understand the significance it, of that date for you? I never forget. Thirty years ago, I'm 24 years old. The story comes out: America is going to be a nation majority people of color in 60, 70 years. People are like, oh, man, please, that's so far away. I'm not going to be here. <laughs> then, guess what? 1990 comes, and then 2000, and 2010, and then look. You have immigration, and then you have legal immigration, and then you have white folks stop having babies, and black black birth stabilize, and Latinos having babies, and all of a sudden numbers, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's not going to be twenty sixty, it's not going to be twenty fifty five, it's not going to be twenty. And number kept dropping, and all of a sudden it becomes, it's going to be twenty forty three. So then people kind of like, wait a minute, I, I might still be here. <laughs> and now and now all of a sudden you now begin to see it. You yes. now begin to see the change. You now begin to see people pop popping up in places. Oh, we, we're not getting black CEOs and Latino CEOs and white men start freaking out because we start seeing white women assuming leadership positions. And all of a sudden, like, OK, oh, my goodness, what's going on? And then, you know, that was a point when you had 20 members of Congressional Black Caucus and then it became 30. Then it became 40. Then it became 50 now it's 58 the congressional black caucus is the largest caucus in the democratic caucus hmm. so now it's like well, like hold up and then all of a sudden november 2008 yes which you really focus on in chapter one help us with that because you you in the first two sections you open section one chapter one with obama then you turn to Trump in section two and whiteness as a kind of currency, that class issue you raised. And then you walk us through history all along. And by chapter three, you connect Trump to this long arc, barring from Ronald Reagan, barring from the playbooks. You know, but as you say, you, you, you say this thing really hit a critical moment when Obama was elected. To because the it came real. Yeah. Because all of a sudden. And see, this is where this is where a lot, a lot of white folks get confused. They go, well, I don't understand. You know, we voted for him. No, a percentage of you voted for him. The reality is Democrats have not gotten the majority of the white vote uh, since the early 1960s. And so all of a sudden it's, whoa, whoa, whoa. This thing's real. And see, what I lay out with white fear, and this is the mistake that a lot of people make. They think I'm only speaking in terms of, oh, it's these white conservatives. No, no, no. It's also white liberals and progressives, hmm. because I dare say. I've experienced a significant amount of racism from white progressives. Mm -hmm. Because whiteness is still the operative phrase. Mm -hmm. It's perception. So I go, go back to James D. Anderson's The Education of Blacks in the South, 1860 to 1935. Yes. Slavery's over. White abolitionists from the North, oh my goodness, we've got to get down South and we've got to begin to open schools uh, to educate uh, these uneducated, illiterate Negroes. <laughs> yes, sir. And they arrive and 500 schools have already opened. That's right. And the, and the freed slaves like, oh, I'm sorry. We weren't waiting on y'all. Nope. That they were like, well, hold, hold up. And the freed slaves then said, now nah, y'all can assist us. That's right. But this ain't like you coming to save us. No. So In fact, said we, we'll take your money, but we would prefer that you just train us to teach because we don't want your teachers. There you go. Say, that's and very so, interesting. And so black folks never like, like we weren't sitting around waiting. That's right. So now all of a sudden, what then happens is Obama becomes president and now becomes real. Hmm. And now all of a sudden, even white progressives have to now confront 
wait, wait a minute. They, they, yeah, we, we, oh yeah, y'all been running stuff too. That's why I'm highly critical in the Democratic Party. Who controls the money flow? Yes. Who controls, who controls the purse strings? Oh, you want our black votes, but then you don't want to spend the money. And so, and one of my criticisms of President Obama is that he did nothing about that. Uh, and he allowed that system to actually even get worse uh, because what he did was because he was black, he did not need the political infrastructure, the sophisticated political infrastructure that's put in place by Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr., Ron Brown, the late Dr. Ron Walters, Harold Ickes and others. And so because he didn't need it, he decimated it, not realizing that he was hurting black candidates before, during his presidency and after him because that system that was created that the system that was created that led to him being able to run, he actually participated in its demise. Yes. And now we're trying to rebuild that. Uh, that's, that's a whole separate book. Uh, but the thing is, the thing is, so now when you start talking about white fear, it's yes, we now have a seat at the table. And so now it then becomes, again, as King talks about, it didn't cost America much to allow us to go to parks, to swim in swimming pools, to stay in hotels. He said, the question is now, are you prepared to write that much larger check? And that's the history of whiteness in America with black success followed by white backlash. It's always like, all right, we, 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 we give y'all some stuff. We pay us passing laws. Uh, that's about it, though. We, we ain't doing nothing else. And we're like that scene from Malcolm X. No, no, like the scene when the cop says, all right, you came in, you came and got what you wanted. Now it's time to go. Right. No, no, I'm not satisfied. That's right. And so that's where we are. And so now what they're having to confront is. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Y- y'all want more? Yes. But, but, yeah. but, but why are you asking for more? Because we didn't get enough. Well, what? And it's like, but is that enough? So five or six years into reconstruction, look, 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 look we passed the 13th, 14th, 15th. You know, we really tired of, of all, we really tired. Of, enough is enough. Oh, so 243 years of slavery that you fixed mm-hmm. in five years. And there's like enough is enough. And that's, that is the recurring theme in the history of a lot of white folks is, We've done enough. What can y'all just drop it? Can y'all just move on? Do you have like wh- why are you what are you protesting? Why do you keep at look? We gave you that law. Well, no, no, that that law only deals with this. And so yes. now we are now confronted with we're saying, no, 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 no. I'm not satisfied. And right. now the backlash is, but you're now taking you, you, you're, you're taking from me. And, and what about my what about my children? Your children now have to compete. Because before you could just make the phone call and your kids right. got the job. Now you got to compete against that well-educated sister and that well-educated brother and that well-educated Latina and a well-educated Asian. Now it's like, well, hold up, wait, wait a minute, hold up now, because we, you know, we we all we had to ourselves. And before all we had to do was compete against 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 these poor white folks. And now it's like, what, what are y'all doing? Yes, you you now are going to have to compete. And then now we are state controllers, and now we are requiring diversity uh, standards if you want to participate in private equity. And now we are city treasurers, and because now, oh, why did I mention those two? That's money. Yes, sir. Because if you understand America, if you ain't having a money conversation, yes, sir. you're not having an American conversation. And white fear, the basis of white fear is about money. Because money fair. in America is power. That's a, that's a good place to pause. We're going, when we come back from the break, we're going to explore uh, another dimension uh, that you talk about that Roland Martin writes about in his book, White Fear. We're going to tie this to something you just mentioned, Roland, the question of memory, the question of the narrative of America, and really the question being asked, what do you want and how what we want uh, differs very greatly from what some of these white folk think we want. So we'll be back in a moment here at the Black Table. talk about blackness and what happens in black culture we're about covering these things that matter to us uh, speaking to our issues and concerns this is a genuine people powered movement There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting you get it and you spread the word we wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us we cannot 
tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Uh, remember to support the Black Star Network. Download the app. Uh, subscribe to all of the uh, social media platforms and all of the streaming platforms for this over-the-top network. And we are joined today by the founder of the Black Star Network and CEO, Roland Martin. And we're discussing his book, White Fear. Roland, when we left, you talked about how to understand America. And you talked about money being at the center of this. You know, very interesting in section... Uh, two, you open with a conversation that Toni Morrison had with Charlie Rose, uh, a question where, where she's trying to help him understand that the objectives of black people don't clash with the objectives of a different kind of society. And when you talked about white folk having their privileges taken away, it reminds me in, in section four, chapter nine, you recount a conversation with George W. Bush around this question of privilege. I'm wondering if, if you might help us understand not only what some of the white elites are afraid of losing, but also, and this specifically relates to chapter five, when you talk about history, symbolism, critical race theory, is this also a war for how we even think about America? Because oh, absolutely. Is excluded. please, please go right ahead. Absolutely. Uh, I'll take, I'll take the, um, um, the second, the second part first. And okay. that is, I, again, it goes to the redefining, Defining of what does it mean to be an American? Mm. What, what, what does it actually mean to be an American? What, what does that phrase even mean? I'm an American. But what does that mean? What, what is the basis of that? Uh, in his book, I Never Had It Made, Jackie Robinson talks about why he stopped um, doing the Pledge of Allegiance and saluting the flag and standing for the uh, Star Spangled Banner because he's like, I know what I endured. I know what you're thinking. And he said if even one African-American uh, doesn't have it made, then I never had it made. Hmm. And, and, and so what, what Jackie is talking about is the black collective. What Jackie is saying is don't talk about how Jackie Robinson has prospered. But if too many but my brothers and sisters are still being downtrodden, impacted by redlining and racism, then I never had it made. White folks want us to believe that, well, Oprah is a billionaire. Michael Jordan is a billionaire. Look at Tiger Woods. Look at Beyonce. Look at Jay-Z. Look at Chris Rock. Look, and so they, they go through this. But Chris Rock in his comedy special says, hmm, he said, I live in a neighborhood and the only two black people in my neighborhood are me and Mary J. Blige and we're the only two entertainers. <laughs> so, what he's, so what he's saying is, how did all of these other white folks become rich and they're not even entertainers? Hmm. They're dentists. Hmm. How, how, they're doctors. How do they like? How could y'all afford? Oh, because you're operating economically at a whole different level. And so, for us, the only pathway is entertainment or sports. Yeah. And so, when you start breaking that down, you start understanding um, how the, we're then are viewed. Now, what we're saying is, no, no, no. We want to be like y'all. <laughs> we want to be a seven figure dentist. We want to be a seven figure architect. We want to be a seven figure engineer. We want same thing. Why do we have to? Because see, if you're telling us that we only have to um, play sports and, and sing and dance in order to enjoy the, what the American dream, what you're really saying is I still need you to be 21st century Mandingos and perform for us. Yes. And how, how does that, it is interesting, Roland, as you raise that, because one of the things that you really carry as a theme throughout the book is black institution building and self-determination. Completely. Uh, in the chapter on history, symbolism, and the kind of theft of our memory, you talk about the role of the black press. And of course, Black Star Network being another example of independent mm -hmm. 
institution. And you're always bringing it. I saw a couple of your interns at this Center for uh, Journalism and Democracy, the Nicole Hannah Jones Open, and your name was raised several times, uh, including by your interns who were there. You, you, do, you employ a lot of HBCU interns. And you also talk about, um, in the chapter on education, the importance of HBCUs. I mean, how important is, is, is the value of independent, Black-owned, Black-run yes. in this work? So I, I go back to, uh, I, I keep, and I keep referencing this because I, I do believe among the thousand plus books I have that where do we go from here, chaos or community, is in the top three of all books that I have. It, it is, it, it, I cannot stress enough. I know I've sold more copies of this book than the King children. <laughs> I, 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 invo- I, I mentioned this in the speeches and lectures Thanks. everywhere. Thanks. Um, because there's a portion in that book where King says that there are four institutions that are prime position to liberate black people. He uses the word liberate. He says the Negro church, the Negro press, Negro fraternities and sororities, and Negro professional and business organizations. He's talking about infrastructure. Mm. He's talking about you need to have institutions to liberate. You cannot have in, individuals cannot liberate us as a people. Hmm. Um, Patton, as an individual, could not do what he did against Hitler's uh, Third Reich. He needed an army. Mm-hmm. And so our institutions are those things that survive when we transition to become ancestors. The institutions, that's what passes the baton. And so you need the institutions that also is reaching a mass of people. And so you can be an individual teacher, but when you are now teaching several hundred students, you are now passing the knowledge on to them. And so now all of a sudden you're teaching more and more and more. Now they're taking the knowledge and going further. So if we are not, if we don't understand that as we are now try, as we're breaking down white fear, you have to build institutions. What I'm actually doing is a reverse, and I, I think the book is right there. It's a reverse of Gerald, Gerald Horn's book, uh, dealing with Claude Burnett. But yes, the, the, yes. Key, but the key thing is not Claude Burnett's Negro Associated Press. It's the, su- it's the second, the Jim Crow paradox. Because mm. in the, as Gerald Horn lays out, the Jim Crow paradox is when we were breaking down institutions, but as Horn right, we're putting a nail in our own coffin because we were fighting white supremacy, fighting Jim Crow. But while we were doing that, we were ending our institutions. I invoked Jackie Robinson a little bit earlier. And yes. so when people talk about, you know, Jackie Robinson made the major leagues. No, <laughs> no. It was only called the major leagues because white folks had more money. And they had better stadiums and better lighting and better uniforms and better travel and could afford yes. different food. But the actual major league stars were in the Negro leagues. Hmm. And so the better talent was in the Negro leagues. They were simply shut out of. So I even don't even want to call it the major leagues. I want to call it white baseball. Yes, sir. And so what then happens because of, our, and, and, and I understand it, trust me, I understand it, but because we were like, no, 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 we are good enough. Hmm. We are good enough, and, and how dare you leave us out? We're good enough. It's like, oh my God, J- Jackie made the major leagues. Yes. And let me be real clear, I'm not, I'm not dissing Jackie. Now, anybody who, who act a fool, just understand, this is literally sitting right here. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Just so anybody act a fool, yes, I'm not sir. dissing Jackie Robinson. I'm not minimizing his impact. But what it was is this, this no, 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 we, no, we, we, we're going to show y'all. Well, you, you write in the book. What then happens? We do it. And the demise of the Negro Leagues, the demise, the demise of an institution. That's right. And so, so what happens? So we take our black bodies, but we take our black dollars and yes. every black person in America becomes a Dodgers fan. And so we're filling the stadiums. And so we're overlooking the fact that when Branch Rickey was looking to sign Robinson, he wasn't just looking at Robinson or he was, wasn't just looking at Josh Gibson. He That's wasn't right. just looking at Satchel Page. He was looking at the crowds. 
what, so what, the what, black dollars followed. So for black people, while this has to be redefined or reprogrammed, yes, sir. we have to understand that when we want to flow over to white institutions, we have to realize that what we cannot do is destroy what's our own because see, when they don't, oh no, we're not gonna cover that. Well then who's left to cover? Oh to cover? no, we're not gonna focus on that. Well, so now we are now asking, please, can, can, can y'all please, can y'all please, can y'all please come cover us? Can you, can you know what? Fine. You can't give us an hour. Can, can, can we just get 30 <laughs> seconds on your air? Yet over here, look, look doc, I, I can tell you um, when I did, when I went to um, uh, the Apollo Theater, when the movie Get On Up came out. Yes, sir. This is the perfect example. And I, I'm not going to name, I'll tell you offline who, who, the sing, who, who the person was. Yes, sir. But here we are at the Apollo Theater. And I appreciate Talitha Watkins because what she did is she was a public, she made sure that my setup was just as prominent as Entertainment Tonight, Access Hollywood. Yes, sir. So with TV one. And so we're sitting there and, and this was actually the second time I met Chad with Bozeman. This is where we actually exchange phone numbers. And so I'm sitting there and I'm interviewing Dan Aykroyd mm -hmm. and I'm interviewing, um, Glazer and I'm interviewing, um, um, the Rolling Stone, Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger. Yeah. And I'm interviewing Chadwick and mm -hmm. I'm interviewing, I'm interviewing, um, um, Spencer, um, I'm interviewing, but there was, there was there's one person who's in the movie who, who chose not to sit down with me. Huh. I don't know why, huh. but they wanted to go sit down with entertainment tonight. Of course. And I, and I start laughing because I'm like, hmm, entertainment tonight might give you 30 seconds. Right. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. That's right. And, and so I will give to you. the people you claim to be representing are going to see you. So again, so for whatever, whatever hang up you had, whatever, you know, whatever mood you were in, yes, which what, what you should have done. What see, I, I need people listening to understand the only reason we even talk about Emmett Till, because Mamie, go see that movie, folk. Yes. Mamie sir. said, you come with me. It was a black photographer. Yes. Sir. I need black people to understand. Yes, sir. We see that image, that iconic image of Bernice King on the lap of Coretta Scott King mm. at, at MLK's funeral. But people don't talk about how that happened. They don't understand. Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, uh, Moneta Sleep became the first African-American to win a Pulitzer for, 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 for photography. What they don't understand mm. is that the white media employed Jim Crow practices that's at right. a funeral That's and right. they said oh the press pool oh hell no it's whites only and there was larone bennett at ebony and yeah. simeon booker at jet who went to coretta scott king and they said mrs king they are yeah. not going to allow ebony and jet and black media into the press pool in the church and coretta scott king said please let everyone know mm -hmm. if ebony and jet are not allowed in the press pool there will be no press pool in my in the church at my husband's funeral and they let sleep in and that's how he was able to shoot the photo that iconic photo that no white photographer got and that's what led to the Pulitzer Prize. And so what I'm saying is that's black institutions where Coretta Scott King did not say, well, uh, the world is covering the funeral of my Martin. And so the Associated Press and UPI and the New York Times and Newsweek and Time uh, and the BBC, they are the majors. Y'all hear my language. Yes, that's sir. the majors. And so, no, she said, no, 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 no. Cause she said, she remembered before AP and UPI and Newsweek and Time and New York Times had Martin in the papers, in the magazines, he was an Ebony and Jet. Yes. And so that's institution building. And so I'm marrying those two by saying, as we are confronting white fear, as we are demanding full equity, equality, I'm not satisfied. At the same time, we are not denying black institutions because even when we're in those places, 
Yes. They still are going to run and control them. And I'm a last point here. And I, I, I don't think I, I, when I use the story of Winnie Mandela, I'm at CNN and um, that they can't find anybody at CNN. All those people who were on air to go to fly to Birmingham to interview Winnie Mandela. Huh. And so John Klein, being president of CNN U.S., calls me and says, hey, Roland, uh, do you want to do this? Hell yeah, of course. This is Winnie Mandela. This is a freedom fighter. Ain't yeah. no Nelson Mandela out of prison as president unless there's a Winnie Mandela fighting on the outside. That's right. And so I go to Birmingham and interview her. And first of all, that was a flirtatious woman. She was flirting with me the whole time. That is her uh, reputation. She, 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 as a photo, she made me, she made me put my arms around her. She looked, oh, you cute. She was flirting me. That she was like, Winnie was a flirt. So <laughs> it was hilarious. We in a church too. It was too funny. So I interview her. And so we get back and they go, oh, we need to talk to you. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, why didn't you ask her about when she was on trial for uh, put putting the you know for, on trial? And I said, yeah. yeah. So I wait. Said, why, I said, why in the hell y'all didn't go interview her? Right. I said, I said I asked her what right. I wanted to ask her. That's right. They said we not gonna run the interview. I went to John Klein. I said, hey man, your folk in Atlanta not gonna run an interview. So I need the tape. I'm gonna run on my TV one show this yes. weekend. Now John was like, great. You know that's that's you know great. I got it. We went to, came to DC, transferred because it was literally on a tape. This it was is. on. It was on a tape. Transferred it, aired it in two parts on TV One, March 2018. I'm in M Memphis preparing for MOK 50, the 50th anniversary of assassination. When the Mandela dies, while there, I interview Reverend Jackson. I interview. Um, I interview um, Randall Robinson. I then tell my man Keenan restream the interview. The only reason. The only reason you or anyone else is able to see me and Winnie Mandela is because I had a black show on a black owned network yes, as sir. an outlet to show it. Yes, sir. that's why I'm talking about we have to we have to we have to be as we're breaking down, still breaking down Jim Crow and breaking down this 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 white fear. We cannot forego our black institutions because they are the ones that are always there with us when we are because they also are the impetus for fighting and the organs for putting pressure on the on the white institutions. You cannot have black institutions that are crumbling while you're trying to break down another system. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for walking us through that, Roman, um, the importance of institutions and also teaching other lessons such as the importance of owning your material, intellectual property. A lot of lessons being taught today at the Black Table. Uh, we're going to come back in a moment with our founder and CEO of the Black Star Network, Roland Martin, discussing his book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds, here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. 
Or forget to support the Black Star Network in every form. Download the app and stay tuned for shows which run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including this one, The Black Table. Roland, you know, you propose a number of solutions in this book. And maybe we could spend the last four or five minutes talking mm-hmm. about a couple of things if you want to mention them. I'll just throw a couple out and you can obviously take it however you want to take it. You predict that Trump was going to run again. He has announced. You identify major issues, voter suppression. You zero in on North Carolina and Alabama. Certainly we see them back. Supreme Court has been arguing them. We've had a couple of shows on that. And you talk about the fact that there's no good to have a Department of Justice if you're not going to use it. And people are calling on Merrick Garland to move forward. Um, perhaps if you'd say a few mo- uh, words about what you see coming next in this battle that we're fighting and how, and you do this in the conclusion, how you expect white folk, black folk, and other folk to respond. Um, black people must be fully prepared because when you, when you back a rat into a corner, hmm. it will do whatever it needs to, to get out of the corner. Yes, sir. We are going to see more violence. We're going to see more vitriol because as each day passes, it's, it, it is a nail in that coffin. What we also must confront, and this is where I'm going to have our Latino slash Hispanic brothers and sisters are going to have to aggressively confront the racism the classism that comes from many of their countries where they have a negative view of black people. We're going to have to deal with white Hispanics identifying with whiteness in America. So therefore aligning with white nationalism. Mm -hmm. Now that is going to be a very difficult subject for a lot of people because it is going to force them to confront the realities of that white racism that emanates from the countries. And so not everyone that calls themselves brown is brown. Um, And 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 that's, and that's, 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 that's going to be real. It's going to be real. And so what, what, what also is going to be happening is uh, you're you're, going to see again, folks are going to fight back which means that when you are in a war, you must be on war footing. You must be preparing for war, which is why I say we need to be fortifying our children educationally. What we cannot do is be in a war and then all of a sudden we are approaching 2043 and the demographic numbers are changing and we and our education levels are awesome, excuse me, are abysmal. We've got to ensure that our kids are strong, up to par. I want us to return to that day of educational fervor yes, that sir. existed uh, that existed post uh, slavery, that existed during Jim Crow when you had black families that had twenty kids, and mom and daddy never got past the third grade, but all twenty kids graduated from college. Hmm. Like, like, what was that? But. You had and black people and they, they never made more than ten thousand dollars. They were broke. But they said, no, 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 no. Y'all going to co-. see it, it was a fervor. Yes, I sir. need that to happen. I need us to truly understand collective power. April 3rd, 1968, <clears throat> MOK talks about that in his speech at Mason Temple, where he says black people individually are poor, yet collectively represent one of the most powerful and the largest economies in the world. And so when I'm t- fighting for black advertise, black owned advertising dollars, that's a collective thing, because if we're able to drive the use, use the power of the collective to now, let's just say we get 10 percent of the three hundred and twenty two billion spent in advertising. That's thirty two billion dollars when right now we're getting point five percent. You talk about on the federal level, we're getting that five hundred and sixty billion dollars is being spent on federal contracts. Yet we're getting one point six, seven percent, nine billion of the five hundred and sixty billion. Imagine if we go from nine billion to fifty six billion. This is where this is where I, I, I battle with 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 folks who who's who who who, who uh, stand and fight for reparations. And, and I make clear. I'm not a po- I can make the intellectual argument. I can make the philosophical, the economic argument as well. But what I'm also looking at is 
who's fighting for the existing money versus the hypothetical money. Yes, sir. See, so I so I'm like, yo, fight, you do what you do. Yes. But somebody over here has to be applying pressure to the system and say, no, no, it's 560 billion right now the federal government is spending. Yes, sir. Where's our fair share? Where's yeah. our fair share in advertising? Where's our fair share in the states, in the county, in the city, in the school district? And what see, again, it's it's understanding when you're in a war, you don't fight on one front. You got multiple fronts happening in a war, and everybody forgets. I'm gonna go back to Patton. Patton wasn't the only three-star general who became a four-star. No, that sir. was Bradley. That was Eisenhower. See, you had multiple generals leading different battles because they were trying to win a war. Yes, we want to act like there's only one front. No, 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 no. Go do you, and I'm not gonna de- go go do you. But over here, this is the front that I'm fighting. So that's what I need people. Uh, to understand what we're doing, where we're trying to go, and what is required. And I need white people. I need white people to be listening to Jane Elliott and Tim Wise and confronting their whiteness in church, in their families. They have work to do. It's not just on us. King said, I'm I'm, I'm leading my people into a a burning house. Well, guess what? We can't always be the firefighter because sometimes we're not at that house when it's burning. Yes, sir. We need white folks to step up. And that's why I also call to challenge people. You've got to, you've got, you've got to do something. You've got to um, be an active participant uh, in this thing because we're not going back. They can, they can get every red hat they want to, holler, make America great again. You can look at every survey they talk about. The optimum period was the 1950s. Well, it wasn't optimum for us. It was for y'all. Yes. So we ain't going back to that. This is now the redefining of America. And now that we're going to have to confront what that means, it's war. Yes. And we have to be prepared for this educationally, philosophically, spiritually, morally on every front. Absolutely. Well, I mean, thank you for joining us and for this book, which seems to capture uh, an entire career, an ongoing work of insight and so white fear has given us a roadmap to what we have to confront and how to confront it we want to thank you for spending some time with us here at the black table on your black star network so (laughs) (laughs) we appreciate that brother thank you so much of course of course brad appreciate you man we'll be back in a moment to clear the table and prepare for our next session at the black table That folks know who they are voting for, but more importantly, what they are voting for. Y'all, we got the free shirts and free lunch right over here. Freedom is our birthright. No matter what we're up against, we're sending a message in Dallas and Texas and in the country. We won't black down. That's what this bus tour is all about. The housing cost is one of the most capitalized areas that we have found people who are marginalized that are brown and black. We are suffering the most, and I think that we have the biggest vote and the biggest impact in this election. I'm voting for affordable housing, for sure. We should not be paying the cost of a utility failure because our elected officials are too proud to say we need help. I know that we can bring out our people to vote. It's a part of our birthright. Right. It's a part of our heritage. And surely it's a part of our present, a part of our future. That's right. That's what's up. And we won't black down. Forward that message to five friends because in that message it's got links to how to get registered, how to check your registration status. Like I said, 2.30, we'll start um, rendezvousing right here on this street. I am voting to let our voice be heard in the rural communities that, hey, we are people too. There are things that we need. Free shirts, free food, and lots of power. We are in Longview, Texas, where Black Voters Matter, 365. Whatever type of oppression a white supremacist throws our way, we will not black down. We are in relentless pursuit of liberation of our people. Freedom is liberation for black bodies and black communities to make economic change through political power. Freedom is choice. 
won't black down. We won't black down. We won't black down. We won't black down. We won't well, black yeah, down. We won't black down. Welcome back to the Black Table uh, here on the Black Star Network. We have had a remarkable hour with our founder and CEO, Roland Martin. Um, certainly now you see why the Black Star Network is important, if you didn't know before. And as he made some closing remarks, he evoked several folk who have endorsed this book. This book, which is flying off the bookshelves, he, he talked about Jane Elliott. And Jane Elliott said, you know, once we get this information in every classroom in the United States, we will all stop seeing race as real and start appreciating it and appreciating all of us as we are. Tim Wise, who said America is spinning out of control, but William Barber, Reverend Barber, said, understand why you fear so you can release and resist it. And finally, Roland Martin writes in this book, he says, I want this book to be the rallying cry of change is now and we are change. So with that in mind and that ringing in our ears, if you haven't downloaded the Black Star Network app, please do so. Share, tell folk globally because uh, this network is on the march and you understand the importance of black owned, black controlled media that is truth telling. Thank you, Roland, for being with us on here on the Black Star Network and the Black Table. And we'll be back next week. 